Hello, everybody, and welcome to Meet a Scientist, sponsored by New Mexico EPSCoR. I'm your host, Anthony Salvano from Explora Science Center. You see the logo right behind me in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Today, we have Dr. Ryan Webb, who is an assistant research professor in the Civil Engineering Department at the University of New Mexico. Thank you so much for joining us today, Ryan. How's it going? It's going well. Thanks for having me. So tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do at, in the Civil Engineering Department. Uh, sure. So uh, I actually grew up here in Albuquerque, New Mexico. So it was pretty cool when I was able to actually get a job at UNM. And uh, what I do is a combination of, of different things, but it's all centered around water resources for communities. So I look at uh, specifically uh, in mountain areas, how much water do we have um, and when it's going to get to our lakes and reservoirs um, and improving how we measure those, those water resources. So some of that is done using different remote sensing techniques uh, with NASA. So I will be on the ground in the mountains, skiing around in the snow with radar instruments um, as there are airplanes flying up overhead and with, with a whole assortment of instruments. And what we are trying to figure out is what is the best set of instruments to actually put on a satellite so that we can better measure how much snow is actually in the mountains and have an understanding of when that might melt out and how much water we'll have available. Um, and then I also try and figure out how we can improve just simply measuring things like snow or rainfall in mountain areas uh, using the classic systems like weather stations. How can we better represent something that might uh, be highly variable or really different from one location to another to, again, improve how we can predict how much water we're going to be able to have available to our, our communities. That's really cool. Not a whole lot of people get to, you know, do winter sports while they're doing research. Yeah, actually one of the, the pretty high perks of my job. <laughs> so you said, um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like you're kind of doing like prototyping of technologies that will be used to like automate the process. Is that, is that at all close to what you're describing? Uh, yeah, yeah, somewhat. So we, um, already have, I'd say, prototypes and some of these different instruments working uh, from airplanes to look at things like the Greenland ice sheet or in Antarctica. And so what we're trying to figure out now is how do those instruments work or not work in you know, complex terrain where you have all these different slope angles in the mountains or different forest canopies, and things like that. How can we try and take those things into account to have an accurate estimate um, if we send something up in, into space. It's a lot of money to say, oh, it works in, in one area. Let's just assume it'll work everywhere else too. Interesting. Um, and speaking of that, what do you find most interesting or important about your research? So I have met the most interesting thing or most important, I think the most important thing um, is as more and more people are living on, on this earth, especially in a place like the, the Southwest, where water is a very limiting factor, trying to get more information to irrigation districts and farmers to, to better plan for their irrigation season um, is I think what's most important from my perspective is just trying to get them more information earlier on so they can be more informed and, and make those decisions uh, with the best data possible. And you said earlier that you're kind of like cataloging the amount of water available, like in, you know, let's say snow in mountaintops and, and tracking right. it as it gets to lakes and reservoirs. How long does that process take for it to go from snow to, you know, the, the river that you have in your backyard? Sure. So I guess it depends on where your backyard is, but um, a lot of times the, the melt season occurs really quickly. So once, you can have a 10 foot deep snowpack and once it starts to melt it's gone in like a month um, and so some of those reservoirs that are up right at the foot of the mountains tend to fill up relatively quickly within maybe six weeks of the start of the melt season and some place like elephant butte that still gets maybe two-thirds of its um, water from from snowmelt runoff or, or sometimes more um, 
that can take maybe a couple of months just because it has to flow through all of the different uh, areas and through the cities that will pull some out and put some back and things like that. Man, that's so cool. Is there a, uh, well, like, uh, let me step back for a second. How did you get from little Ryan uh, to being, uh, you know, a water research person in civil engineering? How does one like find that career? Yeah, so um, oddly enough, it was a very odd career path, not classic career path at all. Uh, but I will say that I grew up, you know, growing up in Albuquerque, I actually was up at Sandia Peak Ski Area pretty much every weekend that they were open. Um, so I just really developed a passion for being in the mountains as much as possible, especially with snow. And then, um, when I first went to college, I actually thought that I wanted to be an architect. Um, and I ended up dropping out because I did not enjoy it at all. And so then I came back to school after realizing that I also didn't want to be a waiter at a restaurant. Um, and then, so coming back to school, I was actually going for construction engineering. Um, and through that, I just took a number of different classes and started to become more interested in water resources decided that I really liked all of the different uh, science courses that I was taking and, and all that experimental uh, component of it. And so uh, I decided to go to graduate school for water resources. And it, you know, I just kind of found the path that um, seemed like it would make me the happiest, that I would enjoy it the most. And eventually, uh, when I decided to get a PhD, I found a couple of different programs that were doing snow research and I actually did not know at the time that you could do that. So I was pretty excited to find that out. And um, so when I went off to get a PhD up in Colorado, I was just really excited to do it. And you know, it ended up working out perfectly because I could, like you said, I can go out and, and ski around as part of my research. And every once in a while I get to take a break and you know, maybe take a lap or something. And that's just ended up working right into my wheelhouse really well. So what advice would you give uh, your 10 year old self as to, you know, get them on this path? I think the, the best advice I could have given myself when I was 10 is just to not commit to any path for a career. You know, I thought that I wanted to be an architect ever since I was probably about eight or nine. Um, and then 10 years later, I realized that that was not at all for me. And it, you know, today, I absolutely love what I do. And it is nothing like what I thought I was going to be doing when I was 10. So I don't think it, it, it did me any good to try and box in what I thought my future was going to look like and just kind of keeping my uh, mind open to other possibilities that, that obviously made me very happy. And when you're when you're off in the field, uh, doing your uh, collecting data for your analysis. Uh, is there, I get, I don't know, in my head, there's this picture of like imminent danger, you know, outrunning avalanches and uh, is, is it just you up there? Do you have a team and how do you like, what kinds of dangers do you face every day? Sure. So sometimes it's just, it's just me. If, if I am going into avalanche terrain, then we, we don't go out by ourselves. So it really depends on where I'm going, what data we need to collect. But I, I will go out by myself a lot of times, and it's just um, not that dangerous. You know, we, we do a, a weather check ahead of time um, and making sure that we're not going to get caught in really dangerous conditions, whiteout conditions. If it's going to look too windy or blizzard, whiteout conditions, we just don't go. Uh, no no da single data point is worth, you know, anybody's life. Um, so some of the bigger dangers that we've, I've dealt with in the past couple years is getting caught in lightning storms when we're way up in the mountains. Um, and so for that, it was a known hazard when we were going out. So we knew what to keep an eye out for. We had a, a plan for how to get to safety, things like that. Um, other dangers at times have just simply been, you know, riding snowmobiles around on, on Grand Mesa up in Colorado. And that can, it, it can be really fun, but at the same time, you know, um, if you, you know, snowmobiles are inherently dangerous and they tip over relatively easily in, in powder. So you have to kind of worry about that um, while you're having fun and also not 
running over the, the plot that you want to measure. Um, but for the most part, we, we try and, and minimize the risks. And when we do go into avalanche terrain, we take it very seriously. And usually there's someone who has spent you know, decades studying avalanches and, and we try and take more conservative decisions when traveling through that kind of terrain. So I've you, never actually had to outrun an avalanche. Oh, you didn't uh, change my mind though. Now I'm just picturing the introduction to the movie True Lies when Arnold Schwarzenegger is like running around on a snowmobile. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. That's, that's actually pretty much exactly what, what it's like. <laughs> that's amazing. Do you have to coordinate with aircraft or does that not happen at the same time? Yeah, so if, if they're doing some flights, we try and coordinate as much as possible. Um, the more you can align your survey with when they're flying over, the better, just because conditions change. If it's a sunny day, there might be a little bit of melt. If a storm comes through, then there's, you know, conditions will be a little different. So we try and, we try and coordinate as best we can. I do not understand how there's not way more people doing what you do because you're like playing with high-tech equipment, you're out in the wilderness doing, you know, outdoor activities, you're skiing winter sports and you're coordinating with aircraft and communicating with teams all the time. This sounds like I definitely took the wrong career path by going into physics. Yeah, it's, I think <laughs> it's a really, uh, really cool career path. And there's actually a lot more people out there doing it than you might think. Uh, I was up on Grand Mesa in Colorado for this NASA project in 2017. And there was I think about a total of 120 scientists that came out that all study snow and were part of this larger effort so there's a lot of us out there it's just probably not as much as phys physicists is there anything else you want to plug before we uh head out today um i'd say just you know keep an open mind and follow whatever you are passionate about if something seems like it's it's really fun and you would enjoy doing it then go after it thank you ryan so much for being here for doing this interview and uh it sounds like you have a lot of fun uh, doing what you do and you really love it i do and thank you for having me